Welcome to your Time Management Revolution. This is Time Management Fixer Helene Sugura. In today's episode, I'll be sharing a previously recorded interview during which we're discussing time management and mind management. Enjoy! Welcome to Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Talk radio to inspire, inform, and stimulate. Bringing you enlightened discussions with authors, creatives, innovative business and health professionals, and ordinary people living extraordinary lives. Sharing their expertise and life stories. Making a difference one word at a time. Now, here's your host... Vicki St. Clair. And welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Well, if you find yourself postponing uh, weekend breaks and skipping vacation because of work or because you have no time to plan a trip, let alone take time off, Helene Segura joins us with some great advice in The Great Escape. And more on that in just a moment. Coming in the second half of today's show, more than six million Americans have a panic disorder. And for many people, that panic disorder extends to a fear of flying, stepping on board a plane, or even getting anywhere near a plane. So that, of course, can uh, interfere with your travel plans. And we are joined today by former airline pilot, now licensed therapist, Captain Tom Byrne. He's got uh, some great tips. He spent most of his career helping people overcome their fears of flying. And his new book is called Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. And uh, that's coming up around 12.30 today. So let me tell you a little bit more about my first guest. Uh, She is Helene Segura. Her book is called The Great Escape. She's been on the show many times before. She's known as the inefficiency assassin. She's a productivity expert. She presents keynotes and trainings based on her book, The Inefficiency Assassin. And uh, she's authored more than four books, I think. We'll check that when she comes on. Uh, She's been the featured organization expert in more than 200 media interviews, including several right here on Conversations Live. And she says that the most productive people in the world realize the importance of recharging and rebooting, which is why she's written this book. And the full title is called The Great Escape, a vacation planner for busy people who want to take a real break from work and life. Helene Segura, welcome. Thank you, Vicki. It's great to be here. It's great to have you back. And... um, I, I need my headphones up a little, Eric. I can't, I can't hear myself here, so I'm trying to wave at you. <laughs> I can't get attention. There we go. That's good. Thank you. Um, so, Helen, um, you've been very busy since we last talked. You travel for work. You plan trips with others. You're writing books. You're giving keynote present, pre- presentations. Um, how on earth did you get time to write yet another book? Well, I've been jotting down notes for several years on this particular book. Every time I would meet with a client and they would say, oh, no, I I can't take a break. I have too much work to do. Or, no, I can't leave work. Somebody else might get my job. So I was thinking of different ways I could start to explain to folks how important it is to take a break. And eventually I had enough notes to where I just needed to sit down and organize them all into the book format that you see. Well, I want to begin with a few whys, okay? And the first one was why you wanted to write that book. We've, we've got that out of the way. But the, the big thing is I know many people leave vacation days on the table. Uh, these are paid vacation days, days that they've worked, they've earned, um, that um, if they don't take them, they lose them. Why are people not taking vacation like they should? Well, there seems to be a pervasive fear that If I go on vacation, if I'm already behind now, I'm going to be even more behind when I get back, and I really just don't want to deal with it. Other folks have tried to go on vacation, but then they just find themselves checking email and checking text, and then it really wasn't a vacation, so what is the point? So there are a variety of reasons why people don't go. Basically, what they have not done yet is put their own self-care and self-health first. Very important. Very important issue. So um, let's look at, um, I think, you know, I was talking with somebody the other day and they said that in today's world, 
you know, it's okay to talk about self-care and putting ourselves first, but it's not practical where, at least where they work. And they work in, uh, they work in um, Silicon Valley, so you can imagine what goes oh, yeah. on down there. Right, but it, it's happening more and more. And then there are many people who work in, uh, as freelancers and work with companies as consultants and uh, a whole bunch of different names, talent, free agent, um, independent, and they don't get paid vacation days. Yeah. So um, that's also part of the deal when it comes to taking vacation, I think. It's a, it's a big issue for many people. Oh, definitely. Starting with the second group that you mentioned, mentioned those people who are self-employed, they're contractors, they're freelancers, you would have to make sure that you save up enough money to be gone for one week and have that as a part of your business plan where you're actually budgeting out instead of paying to go to a, a seminar or a conference or a workshop, you are paying to go on vacation to invest in yourself. You won't necessarily be gaining income that week unless you set up passive income, but it's something that you do need to prepare for. But it's the fear behind that, the fear of missing out, the fear of missing income. If that is the scarcity mentality that one has, then they will always be afraid to go on vacation versus the plentiful mentality where you realize, I have worked hard, I can take a break, I have everything set up so that I can be gone for a couple of days. I like that. for the first group that you mentioned, those folks who feel like they are in the rat race, unfortunately, the lesson that I've learned from them is that when they stay in that rat race and it's constant and they're working those long hours, those folks tend to crash and burn in three to five years. So they can keep up that pace nonstop, but eventually it comes to a halt. And they are not in charge of that halt. That is the problem. But if you can be in charge of a halt sooner than that, you will just be so much more productive. Yeah, I I actually read, I think it was last week, the week before, that um, burnout, work-related burnout, has now become a major issue. And it's being recognized as a medical condition. Mm -hmm. Definitely. In Japan, there's even a term for it. It's called kuroshi. And it's more than burnout. It's death by overwork. Ah. And in Japan, they have seen increasing rates of heart attacks and strokes. And in the U.S. over the last several years, we have seen that same kind of increase. There was a Harvard study that came out a couple of years back. There's been um, a 40% increase in women who have high-stress jobs. They're 40% more likely to have heart conditions, heart problems, compared to years before. So, you know, we're, we're becoming a very overworked society. Yeah. And so tell us what the neuroscience shows us about the importance of taking a break. What happens to our brains when we actually take a break? If you're looking at just a single work day, it's simply stopping after 60 to 90 minutes of work, pausing for roughly five minutes, that gives the brain a chance to recharge. And then you can work for another 30, 60, or 90 minutes. There's not an exact amount of time where the brain is working at its full capacity because we are all different, and we all approach tasks differently. So that's why we can't say the magic number is 57 minutes, and that's when you need to take a break. But studies show that when you do pause multiple times throughout the day, you are far more productive than trying to work 10 to 12 hours straight through. Your productivity just starts to drop off. Yeah, and you've talked about this on our show before. Those podcasts are available, and I took your advice and started taking more regular breaks because I'm one of those who just gets involved in work and just carries straight through. And I found it made a tremendous difference, Helene, so thank you for that. Fantastic. (laughs) Congratulations. So let's talk about uh, another big issue why people never get away, simply because, and I can relate to this, Um, Because every time I wanted to go home and see my mother, and sometimes it was two or three times a year, depending on, you know, her health and what was happening at home, um, you've got to pick a day. And there's never a good day to pick, to be quite honest. When when you're freelancing, you've got to just um, kind of pick a date and make it happen. And you say many people never get away just simply because of that. They fail to prepare. They fail to get something on the calendar, something as simple as that. Yeah, exactly. And that is absolutely key because if we wait and wait for the perfect day, it'll never happen. It's kind of like waiting for the perfect day to get married, waiting for the perfect month to have a child. There is never a perfect time. You just have to pick that day and go for it. And 
in, in the case of picking a day to go see a loved one or picking a day to go have fun, it's really amazing how many times we let the days pick us mm-hmm. where we're going to be down for the count. We have to go to the doctor because we're sick. We have to go to the hospital because we have heart palpitations. We didn't plan for that, but we still made time to go to the doctor or the hospital. Wouldn't it be much more fun if you just plan, look at the calendar a couple months from now and say, this is one day where I'm going to go have fun. Yes, absolutely. Um, another issue you say in, in preparation, I mean, this is basic 101 um, planning, but, but it's something we, we don't do when we're, quote, too busy to do. And that's they, people have no written lists. And I found that tremendously helpful myself. I have lists for everything these days. <laughs> yes, you know, we keep so much stuff in our heads that basically our heads are these cluttered file cabinets. So if we're trying to keep all this information from work, all of the planning that we need to do for a trip, it just gets all jumbled up in there. So if you can have your list in paper form or digital, whichever one you prefer, that's going to help keep you straight on what all you need to do. Now, if you want to get even more advanced than that, then what you do is schedule little appointments with yourself on your calendar for when you're going to actually do those things so that way you're not scrambling at the last minute because you realize, oh, no, I still have 10 things left to to do on my list. Mm. So if we're working in a seasonal business, we obviously want to take that into consideration too. Um, Give us some tips around you know, what you advise people at a high level on that? I advise them to look at whatever data they can get their hands on. If they're working for a company, then you can go to the sales department, the accounting department. If you work for yourself, you can run the reports on your own. What you want to do is look to see when is most of your revenue coming in because those are going to be your high seasons. And then look for the gaps in there. When are the lowest amounts of revenue being collected. Because if you see a pattern to that, then that's telling you that's a fairly safe time to go on vacation because that will be the time of year I have the least amount to worry about. Just like an accountant knows, they can never take off at the beginning of April because (laughs) everything is due April 15th unless they're doing corporate taxes. That will be due on March 15th and also may, but the whole point is that you look at the cycles within your company and see, is there a time where I would have a bigger gap in downtime? However, having said that, you can still take off during the busiest time of the year if you plan ahead for it. Right. Now, let's talk about a couple of Sandras that go along with traveling, and travel, travel insurance is something I never used to buy. I tend to buy it these days just because the world's a different place. Mm-hmm. Um, but your views on that, you say, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's a ripoff. Some people think it's mandatory. They won't go anywhere without it. Where do you stand on that? It depends on the type of travel insurance that's being I have found, for me personally, too many loopholes in delay travel insurance, meaning you are going to be late to something. There is so much fine print in there that is really hard to meet all the qualifications. Right. However, if it's going to be something like a medical cancellation where you can't go on a trip because something has happened medically and you have proof from a doctor, if that insurance premium is going to be less than the change fee with the airline or the ship company or whatever it is that you're using, then it could be worth that travel insurance. So it really just depends on what type you want to get and if that premium will be less than that change fee. Right. Okay. All right. We need to take a quick break. Uh, I'm talking with Helene Segura, productivity expert. She is the author of The Great Escape, a vacation planner for busy people who want to take a real break from work and life. We'll be right back.
Parkinson's disease affects as many as one million people in the United States. At the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, it's our mission to beat this disease. To learn about the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, or if you want to help support our work, visit our website, pdf.org, or call us at 800-457-6676. In the Northwest, contact the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation at nwpf.org. Hi, I'm your host, Smokey Cole Bear. Filling in for Smokey, because after 75 years of... Only you can prevent wildfires. Turns out there's much more to say. Nearly 90% of wildfires are caused by us humans being careless, dumping our used barbecue coals willy-nilly. Guess the song was wrong. We did start the fire. That's why I respect Mother Nature and her trees, whether coniferous or new car scented. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Coming up next week on Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Escape from life for a moment and enrich your knowledge as we share our 2019 summer reading list. From thrillers and beach romance to nonfiction and memoir, there's a little something for everyone. Tune in Mondays at noon Pacific and again Fridays at 6 a.m. Find more details about the show at conversationslive.net. Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Live well and live strong. Reach her great audience and advertise. Learn more at conversationslive.net. Conversation you won't find on the rest of the dial. Alternative Talk 1150. And welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. I'm laughing because I picked up the wrong headphones at the start of the show. <laughs> I was like, why can't I hear myself speak? Eric's cranking it up and I'm listening to the wrong headset here. All right. So these things happen on live radio. All right. So my guest is Helene Segura. I'm sure this never happens to you, Helene, because you're so organized. Oh, no, I am the queen of technology glitches, so if you want to, you can blame the headsets on me. That's not a problem. <laughs> well, I, we're talking about her new book today. It's called The Great Escape, a vacation planner for busy people who want to take a real break from work and life. And it's so funny, so many people I've talked with lately, I think we've had great, great days and then a really sunny day. And as soon as we get a sunny day, everybody's like, I need a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, one of the things you um, talk about is, you know, at the end of the book, you said, don't um, put off your dream vacation. Uh, just plan it. Start planning it. You were, uh, I think it was 2008 and you were on a trip in Turkey, a Rick Steves trip of all things. And you met a couple who were planning this fantastic anniversary thing. And so you did something very similar. Tell us about that. It sounded fun. Right. Uh, they were talking about how every year this one couple who they know plans this huge vacation in a chateau or a villa somewhere in Europe. They fly all of their friends out and they have this wonderful weekend celebration. And my husband and I thought, well, we want to do that, except we can't afford to fly our friends out and we can't afford a chateau or a villa. So how can we modify that? And one day we were watching a movie called A Good Year with Russell Crowe. And we realized, you know what, we want to do exactly that. We want to have a, a family and friend dinner in a vineyard. So what we did was a couple of years ahead of time, we let all of our family and friends know, save up for your family vacation in Provence because we're going to have a big dinner here on this night. So everybody could do their own thing. There wouldn't be any fighting about, I don't want to go to a museum or I don't want to go over there. So they showed up on that evening, and we had the most glorious time. Mm. We joined up with another couple. Their anniversary was 10 years uh, more than we had. So they had 30, and we had 20. And it was beautiful. There were 26 of us. We just relaxed the whole evening, drank wine well into the night. And <laughs> everybody did it on their own budget. So these wonderful bucket list trips are totally possible if you find a way around your finances. Right, right. And what wonderful memories you're building, too. So I want to talk about traveling with other people because this can be wonderful and this can be uh, hair tearing. So, um, you know, I've always, if we've traveled with other people, we always say up front, yeah, we'd love to do that with you. 
Um, but we also like to go off by ourselves occasionally and do stuff. So don't be offended if we want a day to ourselves. How, how do you advise people to handle that kind of situation? Because I found, exactly as you did. The key I, I, is I found even if you do that, Helene, some people will still get offended. <laughs> oh, but you know what? If they're going to get offended by that, then, oh, my goodness, you're not going to have fun on your trip. And they're probably not close enough friends to travel with. Mm. But you set those expectations ahead of time. You're very clear about it. You didn't say anything mean like, you know what? There's only going to be so much we can stand of you. So <laughs> make sure we're free on this afternoon. Instead, you say it nicely. We just want some alone time. And anybody who is a friend will be understanding of that. When we've traveled with other people, we let them know, this is our itinerary. You are more than welcome to join us. Or you can do something totally different. It doesn't matter. But would you like to meet up for a meal at all during the day? If so, where, what time, all of that good stuff. So that way, everybody has the freedom to choose whether they want to hang out for part of the day, all day, or not at all. If you don't set those expectations ahead of time, then it'll just turn into a mess. Right. We are living in very different times right now. I know you were in London uh, when father was, you were trying to reach your father uh, the day that there was a, a driver who ran into pedestrians in uh, Westminster in London. Um, these are things that we do have to take into consideration now. We don't want to be paranoid about it, but what advice... I mean, you've got some great advice in the book here. The first, obviously, is don't look like a tourist. Right. Um, we hear that even here in, in the States. You know, if you go to Florida on vacation or California, wherever, don't look like a tourist because somebody's watching you somewhere. But um, there are other things that we need to take into consideration maybe when we're flying internationally. So share some of your safety tips with us. Uh, one of them is after not looking like a tourist, to also making sure that you have an idea of where you want to go. And if you feel like you are completely lost, just step into a coffee shop, step into a business so you're not out in the middle of the street with a map, a map that screams, I am a tourist, I am distracted, you can pickpocket me now. So just plan to get lost and not get upset about it, just to step into that coffee shop. Uh, the other thing is to also have a meeting point at some time during the day just in case anything happens. So in the case of me traveling with my dad when I went to go work and he went to go sightsee, we knew that we had a time and place we were going to meet up in the evening. So when I couldn't reach him, when there was mass chaos and London was shut down, we knew what time and where we would meet up. And you know, it, it was a little hairy until we got there, but at least we know that that other person Having that backup plan is also key. Uh, you can also go as far as carrying around the embassy or the consulate information with you. So if you do have an emergency and you need to get over to the embassy, let's say you lose your passport or it's stolen, you have that contact information right away and you don't have to lose any time trying to look that up. Right, right. You can also enroll with the, uh, it's the, the STEP program, the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. Um, yes, have you actually done that? I'm wondering how effective that is. Yes, I have actually gotten travel notifications for upcoming trips, which can be a little disconcerting because they give you warnings. Uh, London is at stage two, Paris is at stage four, orange, and so it can be a little frightening at first. So I believe you can opt out of those particular notifications, but the mo more important part of signing up is that if something happens to you over there, then the government has a record of where you're traveling to. So your family back in the States can get in touch with that department and they can help locate you overseas. Yeah. And back here, you know, one of the things that um, increased with social media was um, burglaries at home while people are away on vacation. Mm -hmm. So um, I very rarely post in real time. What do you tell people about that? It's a personal decision, but for anybody who is traveling with me, I politely request that they do not tag me in any of the photos because I feel the same way. Um, I know that safety should always come first, and even though I want to have fun in the moment, I can still enjoy that moment without having my picture up on social media. I don't want people to know when my house is empty um, because to me that's just uh, a welcome invitation to come on in and break a window. Yeah, so I yeah. just ask that they tag me after they get back home. Okay, good advice. 
And so, you know, there are other reasons that we might not be able to pull off a vacation other than work or fear of, you know, coming back to that backlog, being away from, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out at work. Um, You know, so it might be financial, it might be health related. You do talk about a great staycation that you had with your dad. I wonder if you'd share that story with us. Sure. Uh, I had always wanted to go to the Toilet Speak Museum. (laughs) I had heard about this place for 20 years, and I thought... Can can I ask you why? (laughs) That's got to be one place on my bucket list, somewhere that's totally off the wall. So for a staycation, we took my dad over to the museum. One reason in particular I wanted to go sooner rather than later is that the owner was 97 years old. And when I called up the owner to see what his hours were, he just gave me the hours for the next two days, for Friday and Saturday. And I said, well, well, sir, what about Monday? And he said, I'm 97. I may not be around on Monday. You should come on Friday or Saturday. So I said, okay. And we had a great time there just listening to the stories, all the people that he's met during his lifetime and the experiences he's had. It's so much more than just toilet seats. It's walking back into time and getting a history lesson. Right. And because your dad used to do a lot of cooking, you made this trip a lot about food. You you gave it kind of a theme, which I thought was a great idea if you're having a staycation. Otherwise, you can, you know, you can kind of wake up and think, okay, what are we going to do today? But if you have a direction, uh, that always helps. Oh, definitely. Even if you're only going to go five minutes away, just have some kind of plan because what I would hate to happen is you save up to take this vacation day, you make plans to leave, and then you're sitting there for the first two hours trying to figure out what you want to do. So if you want to do nothing all day, then make that your plan. If you want to go to the movies, if you want to go to restaurants, just have an idea of what you would like to do for fun that day. So that way, when you hit the end of the day, you can look back and say, yeah, I did it. I did what I wanted to. There we go. Well, some great information in here. It's over 300 pages full of great tips. So a final thought you'd like to leave our listeners with, Helene. Work on that bucket list throughout your lifetime and not at the end. One of the reasons why I wrote this book is because my parents waited until retirement to work on their bucket list, and my mom never made it because she was diagnosed with an incurable disease and passed away. So please, everybody listening, please work on your bucket list throughout your lifetime. It's going to help your happiness level, and also your stress level. Awesome. Helene Segura, great information as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Vicki. And uh, the book again, The Great Escape, a vacation planner for busy people who want to take a real break from work and life. And uh, you can find more about Helene and her work at helenesegura.com. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about taking the fear out of flying. You're listening to Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. over 111 and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90 and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. This is Martha Norwalk. Every Sunday morning, beginning at 9 a.m., thanks in part to anti icky poo, the product that gets the stink out, we cover the world of animals. This week, June 9th, it's Harmonic Energy Shifting Sunday with Jude and Paul Potton from the Whispering Dragon Center in the studio. They'll have their acutonic forks and chimes, Tibetan bowls and bells, poo a and rattle, ready to do free remote treatments for you and or your animal friends. So plan to join us and give us a call on Martha Norwalk Animal World, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. to noon, right here on Alternative Talk, a.m. 1150. Let's see if I... I guess that... (sighs) This just isn't working. Knowing you have a great idea for a book is one thing. Writing it 
another. So what's stopping you? Maybe you can't find time. Maybe you don't know where to begin. Maybe you wrote a couple of chapters, then disappeared down a rabbit hole. Or maybe you'd rather someone else write it for you. Partnering with the right coach or ghostwriter can make all the difference between talking about your book and finishing your book. As an award-winning writer and strategic consultant, Vicki St. Clair's storytelling credits span from business, health, self-help, and memoir to New York Times and USA Today best-selling anthologies. Vicki partners with people just like you at the exact level you need. Whether you need a little encouragement, editorial guidance, or full-blown ghostwriting and consulting services. If you're serious about telling the story you know is inside you, stop procrastinating. Let's get your story down on paper. Contact Vicki today. Email Vicki at VickiStClair.com or call 1-800-495-7617. See more about Vicki and her work at VickiStClair.com. Oh, yeah, that could work. Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Inspiring, innovative, and a great place to advertise. Learn more at conversationslive.net. An alternative to everything else on your radio dial. Alternative Talk 1150. And welcome back, everyone. Coming up next, we have Captain Tom Bunn joining us. His new book is called Panic Free. Uh, Tom Bunn is a licensed therapist and leading authority on panic disorder and the founder of Soar Inc., which provides treatment for in-flight panic sufferers. He's a regular contributor to Psychology Today and uh, the author of this book, as I said, it's called Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety and claustrophobia. Tom Bunn, welcome. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, pleased to have you here and appropriate because I know so many people who are really quite afraid of flying. But before we get there, I just want to take a little look at your career for a moment because you've had a very interesting background. You were a former U.S. Air Force captain who flew Air Forces, the Air Force's uh, first supersonic jet fighter, the F-100. Then you became an airline pilot. I just heard before we came live, at some point you worked in radio. So, um, and now you're, you've been a therapist for quite some time. Um, how, did that, how did that go round in that circle there? How did you it, become a it, therapist? It really started at Pan Am. A pilot had a course on fear of flying there. I worked with him as a volunteer. And on, at the end of the course, we actually took a flight with, our, with the fearful flyers and we had told them that breathing exercises would take care of their emotional state didn't work (laughs) many of them were sitting on the on the plane during the flight doing their breathing exercises having a full-blown panic attack and it it was an awful experience to be helpless uh, unable to help them in any way so that's where it got started I, i i just felt like you know, it's pretty easy to explain to people how safe flying is physically, but it wasn't safe for them emotionally. And that wasn't easy to fix. Right. Cognitive therapy is, it was, was big, still is big. But the problem with cognitive therapy, that didn't work in this situation. Because in a panic attack, you're completely overwhelmed. You don't have any cognitive availability to add something else that you should do to try to get rid of the panic. So it took quite a bit of time to figure this out, but we had to find something that would work automatically right. and and kick in and stop the panic before it could really get started. Right. Um, so, I mean, you come from great experience to do that, and I'm surprised nobody's really looked at that before. Um, the, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, they, they report that 6 million Americans have panic disorder, um, and you say, and, and the most c- commonly used therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy, which you just said doesn't work with everyone. And according to the notes I have here, that only stops panic in one out of seven people. And um, drugs they prescribe are often highly addictive. So um, it's good to have a natural um, therapy here. 
So, um, yeah, and not only that, it works more effectively. You know, we were able to stop panic at least with 80% of the cases in the airplane, which is a more difficult situation than panic situations on the ground. Right, and you stopped it completely, and then it reduced considerably in the other people, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, it did. And we hadn't even tried to deal with panic on the ground for years. It was just recently when I realized that, uh, you know, I had thought that cognitive was effective on the ground. I didn't realize that it was so uh, ineffective. And that's why I wrote the book, because we were doing much better in the air. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit. I want to talk about the medication that doctors often prescribe to people, my sister being one of them. You could not get my sister... I mean, I, I've been skydiving. My sister, you could not get to an airport without drugging her up first. <laughs> She's like, uh, yeah. oh, when I went skydiving, she said, I'm seriously concerned about your mental health, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but we're joking here, but it's actually the me- medication they give is actually quite serious. So talk to us a little bit about that and why that's a problem. Well, benzodiazepines, uh, Xanax, Ativan, they really are very addictive. Uh, they're so difficult to get off of that the Veterans Administration has banned them, except for people who are already own them. They won't provide new prescriptions for them. And if you take them for panic, you have to take a pretty large dose. dose, And, and then even after some time, that may not work. And a few people have told me that they tried using them for panic attacks and it made things worse. So uh, it, it varies from person to person. Right. You may find it helps, but it may help only temporarily. And if it does, then you still have this problem. If you someday need to come off of it, that's very difficult. Right. So I want to understand the difference between anxiety and, and panic. You say that they're, they're different, but it, does anxiety lead to the panic attack? It could. You see, in anxiety, a person is afraid of something that might happen. In a panic attack, the person believes it is happening. And not only that it, that something awful is happening, but there's no escape. They can't get away from it. They're trapped. Right. And so what does that look like? Let's talk about what a panic attack looks like, because people, you know, say, oh, I'm hyperventilating. I'm having a panic attack. No, that's not necessarily true. There's more to it than that. Well, right? there's, that's one of the main symptoms. You could have pounding heart. You could be sweating. You could have some kind of experience that, that it's like that's a plate glass between you and the, and the world. Reality is not what it's supposed to be. Or even an out-of-body experience where you're looking at yourself from outside. And, of course, a lot of body tension. Right. And you talk about, um, you talk about when we're kids and we have this relationship with our, our nurturer, our caregiver, and how we learn to... Um, be calmed by them and if we if we don't have that if we don't have somebody who's calming us as kids um, it doesn't teach us to um, to take things in our stride basically Uh, you can put it in more clinical terms Um, but does it always start in childhood or can it come at any point I, I don't think it always starts in childhood, but I think the 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 question is you know we all have the computer hardware to calm down. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. We're born with it, but we are not born with any software to make it operate. That's why we depend, you know, an infant depends on its caregiver. And and what does the caregiver do? Presents their face. They talk to the baby. Baby doesn't understand those words, but the quality of the caregiver's voice activates the calming system. And then touch, being held, being caressed. So those three things are the the, it's the software that activates the comic system. And the question is, is this going to be reliably enough given to the child when it needs to be calmed that it becomes serendipitously a program that the child's mind kicks in when needed? Mm-hmm. And so you talk about automatic down regulation. You say that's what normally mm-hmm. keeps the imagination from taking over um, and when those stress hormones are released, uh, it helps us, you know, we, we get to a point where we can't think, so we do it automatically. Just explain that a little bit more, if you would. Well, yes. See, right now, when we're cool, calm, and collected, we can easily 
tell the difference between something that we are perceiving, something that's going on around us versus something that we are remembering or imagining. But when we start imagining something awful might happen, if that triggers enough stress hormones, the stress hormones stop us from being able to recognize that this is imagination. You see, the way we notice, ordinarily we notice whether we are imagining or perceiving. Right, We kind right. of look inward. But if we get enough stress hormones, we stop looking inward. And when we do that, whatever's in the mind is accepted without question as this is happening. And that's why a person can, for example, this may sound far-fetched, but people start thinking about a flight that, that, that they're going to have in a few days. And they think, what if my plane crashes? That thought releases stress hormones and they become sure their plane is going to crash mm -hmm. because they feel it. That's, that can happen in panic with, for example, pounding heart, difficulty breathing. Um, a lot of times we're told that panic can start with a person who has mitral valve prolapse, which is not a terribly serious condition. It's just that you have this feeling of pounding heart once in a while. And that can kick off a panic attack just because the person says, oh, my goodness, I'm having a heart attack. Right, right. And so, okay, so we've identified what starts that and stuff. So let's take a quick break because when we come back, I want to ask you um, how we can get to resolve this because you, you're cured of quite a few people here of, of their panic attacks and fear around flying. My guest is Captain Tom Bunn. He's joining us from via Skype today, and his new book is called Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. You're listening to Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Vicki St. Clair. You know, despite the bad news we hear every day, there are people and organizations focused on making a difference. And one of those organizations is right here, the Seattle Beagle Rescue. It's dedicated to saving homeless beagles, placing them with loving, committed families. Beagles arrive at Seattle Beagle Rescue from shelters, from the streets, and from private homes. And because it's a volunteer-run organization, they depend entirely on the kind hearts and generosity of the community. Learn how you can make a difference by helping to save beagles, go to Facebook at Seattle Beagle Rescue or call 425-381-3792. That's 425-381-3792. Coming up next week on Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Escape from life for a moment and enrich your knowledge as we share our 2019 summer reading list. From thrillers and beach romance to nonfiction and memoir, there's a little something for everyone. Tune in Mondays at noon Pacific and again Fridays at 6 a.m. Find more details about the show at conversationslive.net. At Sundown Communications, we find that most of our clients are brilliant at what they do, but they lack the time and resources to write and create business messaging that delivers results. That's where we come in, providing a diverse range of professional copywriting services for fresh strategic web content, PR, advertising and promotion, marketing, speeches, and much more. Call us today so you can focus on what you do best, and we'll do the rest. Call 800-495-7617. That's 800-495-7617. Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. Innovative business leaders know to advertise here. Learn how affordable it is at conversationslive.net. Seattle, Tacoma, Antwerp? That's right. We're streamed worldwide on our app and on the web at 1150kknw.com. And welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair. My guest in this segment is uh, Tom Bunn. He's a former airline pilot. He's worked extensively with uh, people to help them overcome their fear of flying. 
And his new book, which helps people, uh, regardless of where they are, with uh, with panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia, is called Panic Free. And he has a 10-day program at the back of this book uh, to help people through that. So, Tom, we looked in the beginning uh, segment at some of the things that cause uh, or what's going on in our body and what causes panic. And I want to look now at how we can start turning that things around. And you say that the, one of the first things we need to accept is that arousal is normal. And we, yes. we need to think about that before we have a panic attack. So. <laughs> It's nice, easy for us to say as we sit here, <laughs> not having a panic attack. But, you know, we were talking about how a caregiver calms the baby who doesn't have ability to calm down. Face, voice, and touch. What I would suggest listeners can do right away to make a difference in their lives is think of a person who, when you're with that person, you feel comfortable. A person who is sending you signals unconsciously that you're safe with them physically and you're safe with them psychologically. They don't judge you. When you're with that kind of a person, that actually activates your calming system. So for the next few days, every time you get revved up, imagine that person just walked in the room, says hello to you, comes over and gives you a hug. Do you see what you're getting? You're getting aroused immediately. You see the person's face that has calming signals. You hear their voice when they say hello that has calming signals, they come and give you a hug. And after you've done this for a few times a day, it'll become automatic. And every time you get revved up, you'll automatically get calmed down. Mm. Now, is that what you call uh, establishing oxycontin, oxy, oxytocin producing link? No, this, this is down regulation by activating <laughs> the parasympathetic nervous system, our calming system. The other thing we can do if we know of a situation where we are triggered, we can link being in that situation to being in an experience where we produce oxytocin, which is related in one way to a reproduction. Mothers, when they nurse a child, produce oxytocin so they can't get anxious about needing to do other things. Also, when couples are interacting in a sexual way, they produce oxytocin to cause bonding. So if we can then link a situation that produces oxytocin to a situation that causes anxiety, we can change the anxiety potential. Okay. And so, and, and we get that, we get oxytocin releases when we're cuddling our pets, right? To, I mean, That's right. This is yeah, why pets exactly. are so good for us. <laughs> so, um, Let's look at some of the steps in this in the in the ten day program. We won't go through all of them, but um, what do you say on on day one? You talk about controlling panic and claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is something that I don't like. Um, I feel it. I used to scuba dive, but I didn't last very long because I um, I wanted to have a panic attack under the water, but I knew if I did, it would be a bad thing. <laughs> So talk well, every time you every time you get stress hormones re released, you get the feeling that you need to escape. Yes. And if you believe your escape is blocked, then you could panic. But in any case, what we can do, if you have a situation where you are concerned you might have panic, you take that situation and you break it down into component parts. For example, you wouldn't want to go to McDonald's and have a Big Mac and try to swallow it whole. You take little bites. So you take, for example, an MRI uh, experience. You're going to make a reservation uh, for an appointment. You're going to actually get there. You're going to check in, uh, go to a room, put on a robe, go into the place where the machine is, and so on. You take those steps, maybe a dozen different steps, and pretend that you are with your pet or with your lover or nursing your child or holding a newborn child. Those are situations that produce oxytocin. And you want to go like Pavlovian psychology. You just want to link together the situation that up until now triggers stress hormones and make it trigger calming hormones. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're, when you're talking about the linking exercises in the book, the oxytocin linking exercises, um, how long does it take for that to become habitual, if you will? Be before it, it, it before takes you're... about... Go ahead. Sorry. It takes about 20 minutes to get through the exercise to link it to each of the steps of the thing you're going to be doing. 
and after you've done it for two or three days, it, it, that's enough for the links to be effective. Mm. And so you lay all this out in the book. So do you recommend that people um, go to a therapist and do it with them for the first time or just follow the instructions in the book? Uh, the instructions in the book are fine unless you don't have anyone in your life who you really feel totally calm with and accepted by. Uh, occasionally, I, when I ask a client, do you have anyone in your life who, when you're with them, you feel your guard let down? When you feel your guard let down, that's when your calming system is kicked in fully. If you don't have that kind of experience, Find a professional. They're supposed to give you that experience. They're supposed to accept you completely. And if you do get the right therapist, someone who you do feel completely calm with, you can link to that person's presence and even go through the exercises with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about um, unconscious procedural memory and um, how effective that is, what it has to do with reliving panic. And you describe it as something like, you know, when we first drive a car, we have to concentrate on every single thing. And then when you've been driving a few years, you suddenly think, oh, how did I get here? I don't remember driving up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have a conversation with someone who's driving the car. It's kind of your mental autopilot. We sometimes say people rise to the occasion. But in a life-threatening situation, we 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 believe that people don't really rise to the occasion. They descend to the level of their training. So people who are going to do really high-stress jobs, you can't depend on their thinking to be really accurate when highly stressed. So they learn procedures. Problem A, procedure A. Problem B, procedure B. And you actually do it repeatedly so it becomes stored in the mind. And you can virtually do it in your sleep. So you want those things to be able to kick in when you need them. That's why we set up this exercise to train the mind to step in when you're heading toward panic and actually stop the panic before you're even aware it's approaching you. Right. Do you think, um, I mean, from your experience working with people on this, is this something we need to keep practicing or once we've kind of mastered it, does it stick with us? Well, what I tell people if it's an airplane, if they haven't flown for a while, it would be good if they do the exercise for two or three days before their flight just to warm it up to make sure those links between being on the plane and the calming things are active. And I think if you were going to do an MRI or, or you were going to uh, – if you haven't been on an elevator for a long time and you're going to be on a big elevator, long elevator, or some high place, you might just want to warm it up just to make sure. Mm-hmm. I have to say, um, you know, I credit yoga a lot for uh, me staying calm in situations that I've been in where everybody else is freaking out and panicking. Um, I've been doing it since I was 16 on and off. And I think that tapping into your mind, body, spirit kind of um, practice, uh, you just kind of go into that automatic gear as you as you were talking about earlier. You didn't call it automatic gear, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah, and it's amazing how relaxed you can get in, in yoga. And one of the things that in some methods of yoga or some schools of yoga is where you learn to accept anything that comes into your mind instead of being shocked by it. Yeah. So a final quick thought you'd like to leave our listeners with today, Tom. Well, I, that, you don't need to put up with panic. It's not something that uh, we can't fix. And you can fix it without having to use drugs. You can fix it with probably without having to go to a therapist. Yeah. Anyway, give that a try. And if you do need a therapist's help, there is a part of the book that's intended for therapists to take a look at to be able to help you with it. Yeah, some great information in here. I appreciate uh, you being with us, Tom. And I, I want to make clear, we've talked about flying a lot here because we were talking about travel before. But it, this book is specifically uh, written for anybody who has program, uh, who has, excuse me, panic, anxiety and claustrophobia. It's called Panic Free, the 10 day program to end panic, anxiety and claustrophobia. And you can find out more about uh, Tom and his work at panicfree.net. Tom Byrne, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Vicky. And uh, that's it for us for this week. We'll be back next week. We're going to uh, share some summer reading with you. Um, hopefully we'll get some more sunshine. <laughs> it's a bit cloudy today, but we it's been beautiful. Uh, and uh, Seattle is certainly a wonderful place to spend some time reading a book outdoors in the summer. 
And uh, you can find me at conversationslive.net if you have questions, feedback, or comments on today's show. You can reach me there. You can reach me on Twitter at Vicky St. Clair and Facebook at Conversations Live with Vicky St. Clair. We will see you next week. Until then, live well, live strong. Radio is very competitive. Shows soar in popularity and then flame out. Sometimes, however, a real connection is made with an audience, and success blooms year after year. For over a decade, Conversations Live with Vicki St. Clair has built a loyal following thanks to inspiring and stimulating conversation. Longevity, loyalty, exclusivity. Smart advertisers seek it out. With Vicki's valuable audience, the search is over. Discover the affordable, effective ways to advertise your business. Log on to Conversations Live. Live.net. That's conversationslive.net today. Are you ready for something real, raw, upfront, and honest? Then tune in each Wednesday at 2 p.m. right here for Love from the Hip. I am spiritual hypnotherapist, master esthetician, and the host, Sakura Sutter. This show is unlike anything you have ever heard and was created to help others to help themselves. Hear me follow up with guests I have hypnotized and see how it has improved their lives. I will also spotlight amazing people from around the world. Their skin tips, live readings, and answers to life's burning questions. Join us each Wednesday at 2 p.m.